Okay, so so uh, let me start by thanking the uh, organizers for giving me this nice opportunity to present the uh, talk to you uh, today. So the, the title of my talk is uh, Quantum Aspects of Stimulated Coding Radiation in an Analog White Platform Pair. So this is a work that I have been doing uh, with uh, my supervisor Ivan and uh, Anthony, also from the Quantum Information Group. And uh, although I come from the Gravity Group, Hopefully, by the end of this talk, I will have convinced you that there are some very interesting applications of quantum information theory uh, of continuous variable systems to uh, several analog, uh, you know, several gravity uh, setups. Um, so let me start by uh, telling you very briefly what is the Hawking process or Hawking effect. So this is perhaps the most famous result of uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, huge career, and in uh, you know 1974 he uh, published this paper. Uh, about the Hawking radiation, and you know, the, if I had to, you know, uh, tell you in a single line what this process is, this is a creation of a dozen pairs of particles by black hole event horizons. Uh, now, to expand a little bit more, uh, the main ingredients for the Hawking process are uh, a black hole and a quantum field propagating to the space time generated by the black hole. As we know from uh, quantum field theory, the vacuum is not empty, but rather consists of energy fluctuations, of, uh, which can be interpreted as creation of uh, particles and anti particles. But when this process takes place to the, uh, in, you know, near the event horizon, one of them may end up falling inside, and due to momentum conservation, the other will propagate uh, far away from the black hole. Now, all these particles, the sum of all these particles, make the uh, make an outgoing flux, which is referred to as Hawking radiation. This is a very specific type of radiation, and in particular, uh, it is a black body radiation. So the, the statistics it follows is post Einstein statistics. And the, uh, the temperature of this radiation, uh, computed here, you know, for better, you know, so here, uh, is giving us information about the black hole. And in particular, it's telling us the mass of the black hole. Uh, that's the only parameter of the black hole that uh, this temperature depends on. The, uh, what I find really, really amazing is that you know this expression contains four fundamental uh, concepts of nature, namely you know, the, the plant, uh, speed of light, the gravitational field of constant, and the, the Poisson constant, which is telling us you know that this is perhaps the richest, and if not the richest, one of the richest processes uh, in uh, physical processes in nature. Uh, as I said, you know this is uh, a process of one more and as, as such, it carries. A quantum signature, namely the entanglement uh, shared by the ingoing flux to the outgoing flux. Uh, all this is very nice, but uh, the detection uh, of this process seems unlikely. The reason is that, you know, as observers far away from black holes, the only thing that we could potentially observe is the intensity of this outgoing flux. But it happens that this, uh, this intensity is very weak it's, uh, for typical uh, black hole masses. Uh, this will be, uh, you know, the test should be so low that it will be buried also, you know, even by the cosmic microwave uh, Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, you know, the density of this uh, of this uh, this is going to be very low, and potentially, you know, that restricts the observation. So that should be uh, that seems to be the end of the story. But likely, you know, uh, thankfully, a few years later, a few years later than Hodgkin's uh, uh, theoretical uh, calculation, another brilliant physicist, Ulru, made a uh, an astonishing observation, a theoretical observation. In particular, in that paper, he showed that uh, uh, the propagation of sound waves in uh, moving medium, media, uh, they, uh, they are described by equations of motion, which are very similar, mathematically exactly equivalent, to the equations of motion of uh, quantum fields propagating to the black hole space times. Since then, you know, a big, uh, you know, a plethora of models have been constructed, both theoretical and experimental, 
to uh, mimic this analogy of black hole space times. Uh, the more promising are uh, following these three categories. We have the hydrodynamic analogs of gravity, the Bose Einstein analogs, and optical analogs. And in this work, we uh, focus on optical analogs. So let me show you the recipe of how to construct an optical black hole. So the main ingredients are a dielectric medium, a strong electromagnetic pulse, also called the pump, and the weak electromagnetic pulse, also referred to as the probe or a test field. And the main mechanism is the Kerr effect, which is a nonlinear interaction between the strong pulse and the medium. The result of that interaction is the notification to the index of refraction locally by a term that depends on the intensity of the strong pulse. So schematically, that looks like that. So this Gaussian line shape corresponds to the strong pulse. And uh, you know, the medium extends to this uh, uh, horizontal direction, and the direction of propagation is from left to right. So U is the group velocity of the strong pulse. And imagine that we throw test fields, you know, probe fields. Uh, let's start with the real part, for example. You know, uh, if this group velocity is initially higher than that of the strong pulse, that wave will uh, you know, start approaching. And as it comes closer, it experiences a higher index of diffraction, and as a result, it slows down, it decelerates. And if the nonlinear is strong enough, uh, potentially there will be a location where the two group velocities uh, match each other, and that wave will stop. So that, that will be a location that behaves as a blocking barrier. So uh, that gives the causal uh, structure an analog to the, to the to a white hole horizon. So in gravity, the white holes are theoretical predictions corresponding to regions of space time where nothing, no signal can enter it. And this is what we see here because you know, this wave will not be able to uh, cross this point. The opposite happened to the front part. So if we have a detector far away from the strong pulse uh, and we detect probe uh, fields, we are sure that those fields uh, uh, cannot arise beyond a point for which the group velocity of the probe field matches that of the strong pulse. So that will behave as a, as a uh, black hole horizon. So in other words, if we are here, we have signals that can propagate both to the left and to the right. If we are here, we have signals that can propagate both to the left and to the right. But if we are uh, between those two points, the information is uh, constrained to propagate only from right to left. So that gives us a cause of structure which mimics uh, the other white hole and the other black hole. But more than just, sorry, sorry what? Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is this is the shape of the strong pulse. This is this corresponds to a strong pulse. It's a, it's a diagra diagrammatic representation. So it, this is a strong pulse propagating to a dielectric medium. That day, that changes exactly. Yeah, it changes the direction of diffraction. Yes. And the higher the direction of diffraction, the lower the group velocity experienced by uh, uh, probe fields. Uh, this this figure. Uh, it's just you know it's a representation, a special representation of the of the process. So imagine we we, we are you know observers following the strong pulse. We are coming with the strong pulse, and what we see is that you know behind we have uh, some other waves coming to us, and the front of us some other waves going beyond us. And you know if those waves are initially faster, they will, they will move towards us, but they will start slowing down. So oh, okay, sorry. So the pulse the pulse moves left to right. Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. To the left, so right point, yeah, the interpretation is that you know, no signal can, can end at this region. That's why from this side we see a white hole because nothing can go beyond that point. And if we put this wave here, it would have lower, uh, lower velocity than the strong pulse, so it would not be able to uh, cover this, this point. Uh, so interestingly, this causal structure does much more than just blocking waves. And in particular, it gives rise to the coiling effect and it generates a damping. Um, so an, an extra piece of information before I continue. Uh, it is preferable to work with the reference frame, with the reference frame which is uh, co-moving uh, the strong pulse to have a high degree of symmetry. And in that frame, the dispersion looks like that. So U here is the speed of the strong pulse. Omega and K are the frequency of the wave number with the commuting frame. Gamma is the large factor associated with that velocity. Uh, G and capital omega are uh, parameters depending on the medium. And also omega here captures the effect of the, you know, the care effect. Captures the, it contains the intensity of the strong pulse. So we can show this dispersion uh, graphically. And uh, what we can understand here is that you know, 
for a given frequency omega, we get four different wave numbers. So those are going to be our main uh, protagonists. We have four different modes. It happens that if we compute the group velocities, modes one, two, and four, they have negative, negative group velocity, so they move to the left, while mode three has a positive group velocity moving to the right. So that's going to be the pointing mode. Uh, so what we want to start is the following. You know, again, the same diagrammatic picture. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the main message that I want to convey here is that, you know, uh, this is an algebraic equation. One can solve it numerically at the end of the day, but I want to show you how it looks like graphically. So, the, the point here is that if you fix the frequency omega, we have four different wave numbers. Uh, you know, in, a, in a free medium, you know, in vacuum, for a given frequency, we get a plus omega and minus omega. That's a dispersion. So that means we have waves moving to the right and waves moving to the left. So, uh, but here in the co moving frame, the situation gets more complicated and we have four different waves, different wave numbers. Three of them, one, two, and four, move to the left. And if you compute the group velocity of this uh, wave, then the, it then that ends up moving to the right. So that is the so easier on our waves. Yeah, so, so yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, even even away from the sun parts, we we have we have these additional modes because we uh, do a Lorentz transformation. So if you forget even about the pressure of the sun parts, if you do a Lorentz transformation, uh, you find some additional modes. Uh, so uh, let me sorry to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, where is the physics of the pulse in this picture? Yeah, in this yeah. picture you cannot see the physics of the parts. What will happen is that uh, if we are, if we get closer to the sun parts. Uh, that parameter will change, which will, will, it will affect those blue curves. Those, those blue curves will, will start shrinking, and we are going to lose two of the four modes. So in particular, we're going to lose modes three and four. So we're going to have only two modes uh, corresponding that meaning. I mean, in fact, that means that if we're inside the strong path, uh, we only have uh, left moving waves. So this move, this wave that corresponds to a right moving wave is going to be a uh, it's not going to be a propagating wave anymore because it's not the solution to the dispersion inside the stone plants. Precisely, yes. So this uh, this orange uh, line corresponds to the uh, to this uh, to this uh, function, and the blue curves correspond to the this complicated function. So, and, and, sorry, what is G? G is a parameter depending on the medium. Uh, it's essentially the coupling constant to do the probe field and the medium. So that will give rise to the, to the initial diffraction. That coupling. Uh, yeah, that affects, that affects yeah, the, the initial diffraction. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, but, but we choose you know, to encode the, uh, I mean, if, if we forget about the strong parts, uh, the initial diffraction, we know about G and omega. So, uh, the, the effect of the pass is incorporated in this parameter. Uh, chi is the uh, is the distance from the peak of the paths. So if we take the limit chi goes to infinity, that means we are far away from the strong paths in that region. Uh, chi zero corresponds to the, the peak of the paths. Um, okay. So uh, you know. To rederive really Hawking's calculation in that setup, what we have to do is you know, study the evolution of uh, incoming waves. So far away, you know, far away from the stone paths, we can find exact solution to the wave equation. Uh, in general, those uh, expressions look like that. Uh, this is not the normalized solution, but I want to show you that you know the functional form. So uh, the system admits plane wave solutions. And the sum here corresponds to the fact that we need to have four modes for a given frequency. Um, okay, now the question that I want to uh, address is the following. Uh, you know, first of all, let me mention that you know, if we are far away from the right part, we have four solutions, three of them negative group velocity, one positive. The same applies to the real part. So uh, if we think of it as a scattering problem, we have three incoming waves from the right and one you know, it's going away from the left. And the question we want to address the following, given the amplitudes of those four uh, waves represented by the green color, what is, after the interaction with the white platform, what is uh, the amplitudes of the outgoing waves? 
So uh, mathematical that can be expressed in this uh, uh, four uh, here we have the, the, the indices, these four uh, equations where uh, you know a a dagger are the amplitudes of the electromagnetic field upon upon quantization, and s are the scattering coefficients. So for example, s one one is telling us uh, the contribution of the ingoing k one wave to the outgoing k uh, k one out, and s one two the contribution of the ingoing k two to the outgoing uh, k one, so and so on, so forth. Now those coefficients, you know. Depends, of course, on the model parameters, and to compute them analytically, uh, it requires massive approximations to, to the model. So instead, we solve them numerically. So giving appropriate initial conditions for the four modes. So imagine, you know, for the moment that we know those coefficients, even numerically. Uh, the question that I want now to address is, uh, you know, starting, you know, we, we also have, you know, to, uh, Take some quantum state for the for the initial uh, modes. So assuming that the initial state is the vacuum, we want to answer we want to answer the question: What is the mean occupation number of the outgoing flux from the from the black hole side? Uh, that can be expressed. You know, that can be answered using the uh, scattering channel, uh, giving us the amplitude of the outgoing uh, K three wave. And uh, to address this question, we need to compute the mean occupation number uh, constructed by this creation and the, this annihilation of the corresponding creation operator. So initially, I assume that we have a vacuum state. So I think of the problem with the Heisenberg picture, so the operators evolved and not the, and not the uh, state. But this, this operator does not kill that vacuum. Because of this expression, you know, you see that you know because of the presence of this creation operator, when you compute this quantity, we get a non-zero result, and that is precisely what we refer to as particle creation. So, indeed, starting from uh, from a uh, vacuum, we find that we get a non-zero outgoing flux of particles, and uh, this is what I like to say is particle creation from quantum nothing. That's uh, quantum nothing is vacuum. And uh, interestingly, we find that uh, this expression also uh, follows. You know, if we forget about those coefficients, it follows exactly Bose-Einstein statistics, where the temperature uh, is given by that expression, where uh, u is the speed of the strong pulse, and psi is a parameter uh, depending on the intensity and the width of the strong pulse. So essentially, it is telling us the relative, uh, it is telling us the steepness of the strong pulse at the, at the horizon. Uh, those coefficients, by the way, here we have some additional contribution from this incoming wave, so it's like a tunneling effect, which is going to be extremely extremely small and this is another contribution uh from this uh mode to the output flux uh, this is referred to as the gray factor and has also uh, an analog uh, expression there's an analog expression in the international physical case so if we uh if we uh plot this numerically if we compute this coefficient numerically we find that indeed uh it follows this uh it agrees uh, astonishingly well with the uh, thermal, uh, with an ideal uh, thermal spectrum, where the ideal thermal spectrum is defined, is defined here. So that's the thing, uh, that's the main, you know, the first result that I wanted to, uh, to address here, that we have a uh, creation of particles of thermal nature from the optical black holes. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so you know, if you if you, if you solve you know the, the, the dispersion relation here, we have we have the total four waves. Three of them they have negative group velocity, so they move to the left, and one moves to uh, moves to the right. Sorry. Uh, uh, what will excite this mode? The oh, the green that they are in the vacuum state. I take them to be the vacuum state, so they are just uh, vacuum fluctuations. Yeah, I'm just you know, selling vacuum fluctuations. That is. So, uh, I mean, so yeah, I mean that is a static picture, so we don't see here the time. So the idea is that you know, initially forget about the retardo. So initially there are only four modes. Uh, uh, 
uh, one, two, four. Uh, you know, as in going bold, the K3 is the one here. So that is also the budget state. Uh, but I, as I said, you know, this is a static picture. So if we want to think about the evolution of time, you know, we have the, the green arrows on. This is all of them are the budget state. And uh, the result of uh, those that the horizon is we get an outgoing class of containing particles. So, we, I mean, in this picture, we also get modes to the left. That's a complete scattering picture. But I wanted to emphasize only the Hawking flag, so I just removed those arrows. But in principle, of course, there are, those arrows are going to be populated as well uh, by particles. Uh, but again, as I said, this is a static picture. So, for, if you forget about the red arrows for the moment, Initially, we have four incoming waves, three from the right, one from the left. And the reason is that dispersion is such that, that at any point far away from the strong pulse, we have three uh, 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 waves with negative group velocity and one with positive. But, but this is a static picture. So if you forget about the red arrows, uh, these are the three incoming uh, from the left and one from the, right. From the right. Uh, yes. All green arrows, all green arrows are in the back state. Yes. And here I just do one complete compu uh, computation. I, I compute the mean occupation number of this of uh, this mode. We can do the following for the for the rest, but I just want to emphasize uh, only that on that part. Uh, so which what, is what, what is the holding temperature uh, depends on this coefficient, so it's essentially the contribution uh, from the K1 wave. And uh, of course, one is an analytic model to give you what is that, but we find that uh, that putting temperature depends on the speed of the storm pulse and the uh, parameter psi, which is uh, knows about the intensity and the width of the storm pulse. In other words, that represents the surface gravity, it's telling us the steepness uh, of the storm pulse. The steeper the, the storm pulse is, uh, the greater the putting temperature. So that means. Uh, the steepness of the curvature, so essentially the curvature, if you think of the astrophysical case, that shows that that, that represents the curvature uh, at the horizon. Uh, psi is a parameter depending on the on the model, so on the on the pulse actually, on the strong pulse, uh, on the intensity and on the width. Sorry, what Uh, sorry, what was that? What happens to the limit? Does this affect the water? If you use a very small? So that if that happens, uh, so the incoming waves are going to uh, transmit much higher. So this the tunneling coefficient will be uh, important, then we will lose this, this picture. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a good analog white black box. So of course, uh, that is a model that captures, you know, to capture the causal structure, we need to uh, fine tune some parameters. Uh, this is not an extreme fine tuning, but you know, if the pulse is very, very slow, then uh, waves coming from the, from the left are going to overtake and they will, you know, uh, populate this KT mode. So this is not going to be a good black box. So this is a, a sequence fault, right? Like uh, the soliton sequence. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a hyperbolic second. Yeah, so the chi is that that that's like x over chi or like that. Uh we are going to have x uh, sorry chi over the width of the stone In the output. Yeah, so so the width of the pulse, the width of the pulse, yeah, that appears here. So size is not is not only the width; it also knows about the about about the, the intensity. Because what we really want here is to know the relative variation of the strong pulse. So it's the derivative divided by the, the function. So the derivative of the function over the function. Yeah. It's the relative variation of the uh, Okay. So I conclude my first part by discussing the particle creation and the thermal or uh, the thermal flux of the outgoing uh, radiation. Uh, so now I want to talk about the generation of attachment. Before that, I find it uh, pedagogical to introduce an equivalent description of the scattering problem. So all this complicated scattering that we cannot understand analytically, but we can only solve numerically, K1 
can be mapped to a, uh, to a circuit of linear operations, uh, the, namely a squeezer and a beam splitter. Here I focus only on the black hole uh, part. The solid line corresponds to the black hole. And uh, uh, essentially, we find that is one of the methods of this work is that we find that, you know, uh, all this complicated uh, scattering problem, at the end of the day, can be composed of this. Uh, uh, easy, you know, this simple uh, circuit. So the particle creation happening at the event horizon is uh, represented by mathematically it's equivalent to a squeezer, two mode squeezer. And uh, here we have these uh, ingoing waves uh, of short wavelength. Uh, those are going to get mixed here. And the, on the output of the squeezer, we get, uh, we get the hotting flux and the hotting partner falling inside of the hole. And uh, later on, uh, some of the particles are going to uh, classically scatter, and some of them are going to transmit it, you know, they back scatter back to the black hole. And that has also a gravitational analog, it's the gray body factor. So that gives rise to, uh, to this term over here. Um, so what I said with words, mathematically can be expressed in these uh, uh, scattering expressions. It's linear transformations of the amplitudes. And they can, you know, they are very well understood in uh, systems of continuous variables. Uh, and I'm going to extend this later on uh, in a couple of slides uh, to include also the white hole to talk about the attacking structure. Now, the framework that we work with uh, is the following. We consider a class of a family of uh, quantum states called Gaussian states. And the, the interesting thing about those states is that, you know, in general, a quantum state, uh, you know, to describe it, we need uh, to know the density operator. But with Gaussian states, all we care about is the first moments. All the information is encoded in the first moments and the covariance matrix. So that expresses intensities. And here we have the correlations where a VA vector is defined you know, as a set of all these uh, creation and annihilation operators of all modes. The evolution. Uh, happens as follows. Uh, so to involve uh, the initial Gaussian state, we just need to multiply the initial first moments by the scattering matrix, S is the scattering matrix. And we can involve the covariance matrix also as follows. Uh, to assess whether there's a document or not, we use the violation of the PPT criterion, the positivity of the partial transposition. And in particular, we compute uh, the eigenvalues eigen values of the transposed uh, covariance matrix. And the statement is that if we find at least one eigen value less than one, that means that the state is entangled. To quantify entanglement, we use logarithmic negativity uh, uh, defined in that way. So uh, this is a, a, an entanglement monotone, uh, at least for those states of the bipartitions of interest to us. Uh, and now, you know, in, after you know, we use the scattering matrix that we know uh, numerically. We can uh, we can uh, consider, for example, uh, that the initial state is a, is a is a vacuum, and let's compute the logarithmic negativity for all possible bipartitions. We have four modes, so in total there are six possible bipartitions for the outgoing state. So what we find, first of all, the important message is that out of the six possible bipartitions, only three contain entanglement. And all of them involve the K1 mode. And uh, the hierarchy that argument follows this pattern. So the strongest bipartition is the modes 1, 4. This is the pair created by the white hole, uh, followed by you know, uh, the, uh, 1, 3. And uh, the bipartition 1, 2 is not exactly 0, but it's, it contains very, very uh, little argument. The merit of this uh, uh, diagrammatic representation, equivalent uh, description of the scattering, is that it allows us in a very natural and an intuitive way to understand the generation of the time. So the first squeezer here, by the way, this is the full extended uh, circuit incorporating also the white hole. So the first squeezer here is the black hole squeezer. First of all, we need to keep in mind that, you know, a time is generated only uh, by the squeezers. So this is the black hole squeezer that uh, entangles the, uh, the, this is the, in the, in the output channel, we find the coding mode outgoing talking mode to the right of the black hole and the interior talking uh, partner. That mode, uh, you know, that is the responsible squeezer for creating a document in this pair. Uh, now, the two mode is going to be a document with the one uh, due to the presence of the, uh, the deep splitter. So parts, uh, a part of the talking particles are transferred uh, 
the K2 mode, which is a mode that goes inside back to the black hole. So essentially, this mode steals particles from the talking. So that's why it becomes a double with the K1 mode. And here we have another squeezer that is in the white hole side that uh, creates an argument between this pair, one and four. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that is, that, is, that is the way we can intuitively understand the creation of the target. Now, an interesting thing is that, you know, we see this maxim here. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention that, you know, I wrote this logarithmic negativity as a function of uh, frequency. But uh, the squeeze decreases monotonically with frequency. So we can think that, you know, if we want to uh, vision here the squeezer, we need to go from right to left. So the maximum value for the squeezer is uh, to low, lower frequencies. So uh, what happens here is that, you know, the value of the squeezer depends on the Hawking temperature. So if we assume a symmetric pulse at both horizons, we're going to have the same Hawking temperature. Uh, so the two squeezing amplitudes are going to be uh, the same. But the two squeezers are kind of, uh, they compete each other in the sense that, you know, uh, this, this squeezer uh, uses a document in this uh, by partition, creates a document in this by partition, and this squeezer in that. But both squeezers involve the K1 mode. So the more the K1 mode gets a with to the K4 mode, the less it becomes a with to the K3 mode. Uh, that is you know, a document monogam. So uh, the result of this competition is that we get this maximum here. Uh, uh, okay, so again, this plot is generated by considering vacuum. Let's now study a more realistic case where instead of inputting vacuum, we have a thermal uh, state. So here we incorporate the effect of the, the environment. Uh, that's a general expression for the, for the thermal noise. Uh, here I give it generic, but uh, at the practical level, it is convenient to consider that uh, almost, let's do a simplification that almost. Uh, uh, the noise is the same for all four modes. And if we plot the strongest uh, generated argument by partition here, one, four, if we plot this logarithmic negativity, we find the following. So the blue curve corresponds to the noiseless case, zero noise. So the generated argument is never zero. In that case, it uh, follows asymptotically approaches zero uh, very large frequencies. But when we, incl uh, when we include when we incorporate the effect of the noise, we see that the uh, generated argument reduces significantly. And more than that, there is, there's going to be a value for the frequency at which uh, a document vanishes completely. And the greater the noise, uh, the greater this effect, this endagment degradation is. So uh, conceptually, that poses serious uh, restrictions for the detection of the Hawking, uh, you know, the quantum aspects of the white, white hole. Uh, white black hole uh, attachment generation. Uh, so some you know, calculations suggest that you know, even environmental noise of the uh, order of magnitude uh, 50 Kelvin is sufficient to, kill, uh, to completely uh, kill the attachment here. Um, so that poses a severe problems of observing the quantum aspects of the process. One way, one way out, which is going to be the main contribution of this work, is uh, a strategy called you know, the stimulated process. So instead of inputting vacuum, uh, let's input a non-vacuum state. On, and by that, I mean on top of the environmental nodes. One candidate is a coherent state. The good thing with the coherent state is that it increases the intensity of the Hawking radiation, but it fails to uh, increase the generated attack. And the reason is that the coherent state uh, changes only the first modes of the Gaussian, the first moments of the Gaussian uh, state, but it doesn't affect the covariance metric. So the covariance metric is the same uh, for the vacuum. So no more inductive generated. An alternative is to use single mode squeeze state. So we have four inchoid modes. One of them, we squeeze it, and then we put it back to the white black mode. Uh, and we find that indeed, with that, in that case, we can increase also the intensity of the Hawking radiation. But more than that, we can also stimulate the generation of the dump. So in particular, uh, we find the following. Fixing the background noise to a certain value, uh, we see that in the absence, Ri here is the amplitude of the initial squeezing. Uh, so in the absence of the initial squeezing, so inputting just thermal noise, we find that the blue curve is what we saw earlier. Uh, that is low, then uh, that's a cutoff here. But 
if we have if we include the initial squeezing to, to one of the modes, we see that uh, the entanglement produced is uh, greater, and, but also the cutoff is moved to the right. So uh, that essentially revives the entanglement generated by the by the you know, uh, optical white plateau. Um, so yeah, I mean this is the slide that justifies the the title of my of my talk today. Uh, and just let me you know, finish with uh, showing you some uh, take on messages. So if you didn't get a lot of this talk, at least get these three final points. You know, uh, the black hole uh, causal structure can be reproduced in a dispersing fluid uh, medium, and that is what we call as analog uh, black holes or analog gravity models. A black hole can be thought of as a two-mode squeezer. So at practical level, this is what a black hole is. It's just a two-mode squeezer. And finally, you know, the main uh, result that I showed you today is that you know uh, there is, you know, in a physical scenario, there is an environmental noise. The environmental noise kills entanglement. But if we stimulate the process by you know considering a single-mode squeeze state, we find that we can uh, overcome the problems generated by the noise and by environmental noise. And that uh, you know enhances both the pointing intensity, which is important for the detection of the pointing radiation, but also for the uh, detection of the of the entanglement. And and with that I would like to close the thing for the other question. Just uh, since there were many questions throughout we'll just move to the coffee break and you can ask an interesting question during the break. Thank you again. Thank you.